Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to another history workshop seminar, which is being recorded. Uh, and uh, today we are going to be engaging with our esteemed colleague here in the history workshop, uh, Asha, Asha Gamedze, who is a uh, cultural worker and is doing his PhD research on uh, the relationship between study and struggle in the history of the Yuchi Chan Club and the National Liberation Front. Um, and today, judging by the, his paper and by the abstract, he'll be giving us a very exciting presentation on his paper titled, The Azanian Liberation Front, Notes Towards an Investigation. Uh, so, uh, without any other delay, I think uh, Asher, if you could please indulge us with your with your presentation. Cool. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, and yeah, thanks to Chris and Jogu for uh, setting this up and inviting me to uh, present something. Uh, so, greetings to everyone. It's nice to see some some comrades and some friends and some fellow history workshop folks uh, around. Uh, so yeah, thanks for joining to uh, listen to this work in progress. Um, so I, um, I'm going to resist my intuitive presentation strategy, which is always to kind of improvise most, most of the things. Uh, but I found that I often dig myself into holes and try and clarify things through extended monologues um, with myself. So um, hoping it won't be too boring, but I'm going to read quite a lot of sections from the paper today, um, just because I want to get as much in as I can. And I think that's the best way to do so. Obviously, I can't um, go through the whole thing because uh, that will take us a little bit further over time. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that I have really just put this, um, put this together um, the seminar, the invitation to do something at the seminar was really uh, an invitation to kind of work on something new that I'm intending to work on for my PhD. Um, but this is kind of, you know, where the work is at right now. Um, so it needs a lot of work and I'll appreciate people's comments, thoughts, questions at the end. Um, yeah, the, the title of the work at the moment is called the Azanian Liberation Front, Notes on an Ongoing Investigation. Uh, I've got just two epigraphs at the beginning of the paper, which I'll read to kind of hit, help set the kind of scene somewhat. Um, the first one is from Johnny Issel, uh, who we'll hear a little bit more about later in the paper. He says, you see in 1981, the political situation in the country, especially in the Western Cape was quite amorphous. Nobody at that point even thought of planting their own flag anywhere. It was only from 1981 onwards that people started thinking of putting down the black, green, and gold. The second epigraph is uh, from the infamous Major Snayman, and this is from um, the stand. So there were discussions on the establishment of a revolutionary front of the ANC and the PAC, which, according to him, are terrorist organizations and the Unity Movement of South Africa and the BPC, the Black People's Convention. I further put it that we had information that plans had already been made for him, Mr. Biko, to go overseas so that these four organizations could come together in the United Front. I put it to him that he had discussions with Robert Subukwe, the president of the PAC, who was restricted. Okay, to introduce um, the project, um, the Azanian Liberation Front, which I'll speak about as the ALF, was a planned organizational form that, is, that aspired to cohere various, various elements and tendencies within the national liberation movement, internal and external to South Africa, into some kind of united front. The planning and organizing for it took place between about 74 and 77, and the front was to be based on some kind of common understanding and minimum program around the revolutionary project of national liberation. Uh, this paper is about 
the organizing and the planning to set up the front, as well as the context out of which it emerges, rather than the front itself, which never actually materialized. Um, so I'm going to skip a section on sources and the genesis of the project. Um, we, we might we can discuss a little bit about that in the, in, in the Q and A. Um, what I want to do before getting into discussing the front is kind of discuss a little bit of the context out of which it emerges. Um, and I want to highlight mainly two points, uh, three points. Um, the impetus, the main, excuse me, the primary impetus for establishing the front uh, came from the Black Consciousness Movement. Um, and um, that had been the desire to establish some form of unity um, and bring the, the liberation movements together into some uh, organized form had been um, for a number of years internal to the BCM, um, not only an interest, but a, a, some form of uh, policy in, 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 in their politics. Um, the second point I wanted to raise was that um, around from around the mid mid seventies, um, a number of conflicts and tensions had started to emerge between um, some of the exiled leadership of uh, liberation movements and the internal wing. And a lot of um, those some of the problematic developments of that were that the work of uh, and the safety of internal um, comrades was often being compromised by the way in which exiled um, leadership was sending people into recruitment work, uh, et cetera. Um, the third thing I wanted to, to, to mention in this kind of context or background to the establishment of the front was, um, I guess an ethos or a, a, a um, there's a non-sectarian uh, ethos in the, the, the national liberation movement in this period of uh, the mid 70s. And that, that is expressed through um, uh, reading groups, for example, where um, a number of particularly younger BC militants um, who were interested in expanding their uh, kind of intellectual and political framework were seeking out some of the older um, comrades who had just returned from, from the island. And there was um, various forums in which ideas, positions were debated and discussed, things were read. Um, and there was also instances where people were organizing um, from within this kind of non-sectarian milieu where people from the Black Consciousness Movement, the PAC, the ANC, um, some of the independent socialist groupings that, 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 that Neville speaks about um, in his piece on the, the background to the Azanin Manifesto. All of these groups are working together uh, intellectually, but also politically. There was, uh, there was a planned demonstration around the, the, the independence of Transkai that actually never actually ended up taking place because uh, in 76 kind of uh, erupted and threw a lot of, uh, threw up a lot of new questions and new opportunities. Um, but that's the last thing I wanted to highlight about that moment, um, which is kind of the background to the front, that there's this non-sectarian politics um, and that that's the background against which the, the front is organized. Um, in some senses, it's, it's, uh, it's conditions of possibility within the liberation movement. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go on to the, the, the next section of my paper, uh, organizing the front, plans, discussions, principles, and sticking points. Uh, the slow process of planning and organizing the front took place under cover and the conditions of state surveillance and repression. Comrades who were involved in the process were situated in different parts of the country. The Eastern Cape and parts of Natal being proximate and the Eastern Cape playing host to the center of black consciousness activities in Ginsburg were the places where the talks were most developed. In those regions, as well as in parts of Cape Town, there was the strongest consensus and consciousness around the front amongst the various movements. 
In order to meet, the protagonist often had to either spirit themselves away under the cover of darkness and pretense in an attempt to fool the security branch or fabricate alternative stories of why they needed to travel. On the one occasion that Biko and Sobukwe got to meet in person, it was to discuss the front, and the latter actually took on a case. He was working um, as a lawyer. He took on a case in a close by district uh, so that he could travel through Ginsburg in order to meet Steve Biko. In addition to the Black Consciousness Movement, who initiated and was driving the process, uh, and Sobukwe, who was a supportive and uh, representing the PAC in the attempt to build the ALF, the other formations included certain elements of the unity movement and um, so called Neville's group. Uh, the position of the ANC presented a particular kind of challenge at that moment um, for a number of protagonists in the group. There were issues mentioned above uh, where elements of the ANC had become hostile to um, the Black Consciousness Movement, and there were witting or unwitting attempts to undermine attempts of the movement to organize inside the country, and um, that was unnecessarily exposing cadres to the police. In addition, there was the question of the South African Communist Party and its relationship with the ANC, which was a problem for various elements of the Black Consciousness Movement, the Pan-Africanist Congress, and the independent socialist groups for some different and some overlapping reasons. Um, Derek Naidu recalls that the ALF included those elements of the ANC that were not the Communist Party ANC, Communist Party ANC. Uh, and this section, according to him, was represented by Paolo Jordan in his recollection and that the SACP was explicitly excluded. Uh, Naidu felt that this was a mistake, the exclusion of the PS, um, the SACP, because of the level of organization that they had and the resources they had access to, um, as well as the fact that their existence, their exclusion, sorry, courted their resistance, um, and they subsequently branded the attempt third force in an imperialist ploy. Peter Jones, who was deeply embedded in the process, um, said that Griffith and Klenge, who he recalls as the person of highest office in the ANC at that time on the internal front, was that organization's representative and that he was in agreement with the proposed United Front in principle. Uh, John Issel, um, who came up in the Black Consciousness Movement and later joined the, the ANC, said that, uh, sorry, said that Biko, Sobukwe, and Neville had reached some form of agreement already, and that the planned meeting between Biko and Neville was to clarify their position with regard to the ANC and what they were going to put together. So a number of people are, recall the role and position of the ANC as, as, as different somewhat in, this, um, in the formation. After reaching consensus inside the country, it was planned that a representative from the United Internal Movement would go outside the country to meet the external structures, in particular with the NC, because the internal group wanted access to the level of organization and diplomatic effectiveness to discuss the proposal. Uh, two, narratives, two narratives exist that are not necessarily mutually exclusive or contradictory regarding how this is going to take place. One narrative is that Biko was uh, going, quote unquote, abroad to meet with them. And there was a plan for him to go to Swaziland for one night where that meeting would take place. Bani Pichano, who was outside at the time, was one of the people who was supposed to assist with setting up that meeting. Another, the other narrative is that both Neville and Biko were going to go out and discuss not only the question of unity internal to the country, but also externally and importantly, uh, with regards to potentially building um, a united front of the ambulance as well. Uh, I quote from, from, from Neville, um, also unrecorded, but equally significant was the plan that we in Cape Town had worked out in conjunction with and at the initiative of Steve Biko and his comrades in Ginsburg to send abroad myself and comrade Steve in order to discuss with the armed movements in exile the suggestion to constitute a single liberation, United Liberation Army that would be complemented and represented by the Black People's Convention as the legitimate voice of the oppressed inside the country. End of quote. The exact organizational form of unity that was going to be proposed is somewhat unclear. There seems to have been various options on the table put forward by different tendencies in the one, including the one Neville refers to 
which was basically a merger of all the organizations internally into the BPC and externally into a single armed wing. Um, talks were very advanced within the country and the plan was to form something long-term through an extended process of consultation rather than strategic or tactical unity based on one single issue or aspect of the struggle. Uh, the thinking was that the front could not only resolve the emergent issues of disconnection between different wings of the organization in exile and internally and different organizations, but could potentially streamline the efforts of the, the movement as a whole toward the goal of national liberation from apartheid. Um, to the extent of meetings, Biko and Jones had synthesized the conversations they had had with the various comrades and had drawn up a paper with minimum demands that had been endorsed by all the movements internal to the country up to the highest level, with the exception of the funding issue. The funding issue um, was as follows. There were reports floating around in the liberation movement that the Black Consciousness Movement had been taking funds for their activities from, uh, quote unquote, the Americans. This was known and was a point of contention both internal to the PCM among certain elements, as well as uh, in the process of organizing the front between other movements. Um, Neville had a mandate from the group that he represented, Neville Alexander, not to meet Biko until the Black Consciousness Movement had clarified the question of the funding. Um, um, those who came from the unit background, uh, not necessarily involved at that time in the unity movement. The politics of non-collaboration um, was used to say that no form of principled unity, principled unity could take place if certain elements of the front were taking money from the oppressors, the imperialists. Um, the unplanned meeting that was attempted by Biko and to meet Neville at his mother's house was to be the final con consultation before the internal liberation movement would have by that time reached a consensus on the form and program of the United Front. The meeting tragically never happened and on the following day, Jones and Biko were arrested on their way back to Ginsburg. Under arrest, Biko and Jones consumed the paper that represented discussions, plans, travels and meetings um, and principles that were developed over three to four years of underground organizing. Uh, that was under the conditions of arrest when they realized that they had this piece of evidence of the front on them. Uh, I quote from, from, from Jones, the basic point of departure in the document uh, had been that the kind of differences amongst the liberation movements in this country were not fundamental differences. If it is a difference in the first instance, it's a postponable dis difference in terms of the priorities of where we are today and where we need to get. On basic issues like the land question, uh, understanding and even and the understanding even in people's minds of the land question issues like that issues of race um, stuff like that that was the context content of the, um, the document um, that was essentially a statement of common ground end of quote and a bit of paraphrasing um, with the eating of the principles and minimum program for the formation of the air left went the material basis and evidence of the front um, the detention and execution of Biko and the arrest of most of the BCM leadership subsequently not only had obvious adverse effects on the BCM itself, forcing a less, uh, a younger, less trained cadre into leadership positions prematurely, it basically also arrested the ALF before it got off the ground, um, after the front. Um, Chris, will you uh, give me a shout out to how much time I have left, please? Um, so, at, but you have one minute left. <laughs> then I have it's one minutes. minute left. Yeah, but okay. yeah, I guess okay. you can okay. add. Okay, cool. I've got like a page and a half to kind of go through. I can, I can cut some of that out. Um, Jones rec recollected that when he got out uh, of jail after 18 months, this is in late 79 or 1980, even though the desire to unite was still there among some people, the conditions had shifted and it was harder to advance the cause in various quarters. Even by 1977, there had been a grouping internal to BCM that thought that the attempt was slightly romantic. Some of those who had gone into exile from early in the de decade, based on their own experiences, efforts, 
an assessment of the terrain had sent messages back home um, trying to quote convince us that it was so difficult and manifestly hostile between the organizations that it was going to take a miracle to bring together. Um, in the wake of the crushing of BCM um, and the relatively open political platform um, that had been developed or established around 1780, this is a quote again from Jones, he said the ANC was circulating an instruction from outside um, that said the ANC supports unity of the struggling people. Its definition of unity, however, now became unity under the auspices or the wide influence of the ANC. In other words, people were encouraged to start structures. It was very finely laid out there, start structures for unity within the confines of the, the Freedom Charter. This was long before the UDF ever became a structure or an issue as such. It continues. The Black Consciousness Movement, which said that people have to be on their own uh, and they have to rediscover themselves, with the falling away of the compulsion that the BCM represented, the excuse, excuse also fell away for why we have to submit ourselves to broad unity. Because then from 79 onwards, you find the manifestation of political competitiveness in this country. Some of the manifestations of this competitiveness, uh, sorry, end quote, some of the manifestations of this competitiveness are made reference to in the first epigraph of the paper um, where the, the ANC uh, takes on a, a more prominent role inside the country, planting flags at funerals, etc. Um, more direct forms were the, non, the forms of violence that erupted in various places across the country between the youth of the so-called Chartist persuasion and the Zappa aligned youth. These struggles and a whole series of other developments ushered in the next period of fronting in the national liberation movement. Um, let me end there. I have a, there's a small, short kind of concluding paragraph, which is abrupt. Um, but um, yeah, maybe I can end there and hopefully some of the discussion will bring out additional questions and points and things that I will undoubtedly have missed. Thanks. Great, thanks Asha for the very interesting narratives that you bring up. Um, and yeah, definitely I think there will be some space uh, during the, the Q&A, maybe to bring up those last few points that you uh, couldn't discuss. Um, but yeah, so now I'd like to kind of hand the floor over to everyone, uh, where we could just uh, bring up some questions and comments. Um, so we'll do just like a, a quick round now, of maybe three questions, um, and, and then hand it back over to Asha. Uh, so, yeah, any questions or comments? So we have Noor and then Tepiso. So Noor, if you could go first. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chris, and thanks very much, Ash. It's fascinating. I think this is really... A, you know, a crucially important moment in the constitution or lack thereof uh, of a kind of different configuration of liberation politics. Um, and so one might um, kind of regard it as an opportunity missed. Um, I, I have uh, initially two questions and I, you know, I might, uh, I might uh, try and get a, a second bite at the cherry. Uh, the first one is about uh, kind of comparing this moment uh, to a moment before and then a moment after to constitute uh, United Fronts. Um, the, the moment before is immediately after Sharpo, uh, the South African United Front, which was largely an attempt of the exile movements to constitute a United Front that I suppose one could say is spectacularly failed quite soon after its constitution. And then a few years later, from your example, uh, you know, the, uh, the National Forum, and then I suppose one could say the, the UDF as well. And I, I, I wonder if you, if you could reflect on those different experiences um, and whether there's something uh, in the uh, kind of uh, uneven success, I, I was going to say failure, but let me say uneven success in the constitution of United Fronts 
uh, amongst the kind of broad left organizations. Um, and that, that leads me to a kind of conceptual question, and that is, uh, what, what, what is a united front? Um, uh, what, what, what is the idea of a front? Because what, what, what you're talking about are sort of, uh, attempts by key individuals uh, to, to constitute something differently. And it seems to me that uh, the initiatives uh, advance more internally than externally. And is that because organizations like the ANC and potentially the PAC were in fact on a different trajectory and were simply not interested in creating a united front in which they would have to uh, you know, behave quite differently organizationally and politically in trying to create a new kind of liberation movement? Thanks. Thanks, Noah. Uh, then next we have Tsepiso. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Um, this is very interesting, Asha. I enjoyed uh, your presentation. So thank you for sharing with us and I look forward to reading the, the complete paper. Um, my first question, before I saw that he's in the room, I was gonna ask if you've engaged with Toivo's, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Toivo Asheka's work, because um, I think that there is a lot in there that would be uh, very rich for what you're doing. But I see Toy was here, so if you haven't, then you can talk to him directly. Um, he might have some questions or whatever. And then the second one is, um, I don't know if it relates to Noor's question. Um, oh yeah, he says, you and Asha are comrades, of course. <laughs> um, so the second one is, um, I think it might relate a little bit to what Noor said, maybe not, is that you know when you were talking, I was wondering if, um, you know, the is would you cons would you like consider the ALF like a black nationalist version of what later then um, was the UDF? You know the 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 UDF that emerged in the in the light in the nineteen eighties, and is and and could that could the black nationalist um, how can I say structuring be the reason why or part of the reason why you know you you actually you just did a a number of reasons why it didn't it didn't quite take off, but could the black nationalist angle be why it wasn't um, uh, as successful, for lack of a better term, as the UDF um, later then you know became to be in terms of you know the following and the unity and all of that, and yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Trepiso. and then lastly, Marcus. Thank you. Chris, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, Ash, thank you very much. Very interesting paper. And um, uh, I also see some people uh, like to say hello to Karen and Sam, Salim and others. But uh, what I would like to say, um, or firstly ask, uh, because there is a narrative that the UDF was formed by the ANC and its underground countries. My own experience, it, it was a grassroots movement. So at the time, my understanding and experiences is that there were two uh, processes. One, a grass, a bottom up, community organizations, youth that went to form the U United Democratic Front. And then there was the other process, left intellectuals, academic, I mean, uh, activists, this what we call the attempts to form a United Front. Um, and I think, and I would really like to just jump to, to what is happening now. I think we are again at, at a stage uh, where there's a mess from my little experience with organizations through my work in what the, is called the Right of Children to Food campaign. We have 19 organizations with a number of uh, co uh, partners in that uh, campaign, uh, independent, like the Food Justice Coalition and a number of others. We are, are composed of, of, of 
structures like the People's Health Movement, uh, number of uh, early childhood development programs, uh, community structures. And there's a great demand for a united effort in communities. Mother, and especially mothers, we have right now in the country about 200,000 community-based organizations. And the few that we've been in contact with, like almost exclusively women, uh, there is a, they really are crying for money, requesting that we begin to build a movement of movements. A unite, uh, uh, unity and diversity, if you want to call that. So yes, I think it is very interesting. I think for my for my purpose of, of, of my own uh, experience, uh, involvement now, some of what you've re uh, recorded and, and captured is really uh, helping to, to chart the way forward. I think it's very important. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a luxury. The sectarianism, et cetera, is a luxury. And I've always, and well, not always, I've come to believe that this thing about calling the, the, the United uh, 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 Front of, of the left, I think the left will only unite if they begin to work with communities. Yeah. It is only in that process that the left will, uh, will, through a process of engagement, yeah. in fact, I have, quite early in my experience as an activist, we must learn from our people. Our people are our main teachers. They may not know Marx, but they know capitalism and exploitation better than all people. You know? uh, and I think especially mothers, in fact, this whole thing wanting to renew communities and the, the left is extremely guilty of that. What the hell do people think mothers have been doing all these years? It's precisely to struggle for renewal all the years, because they're right there. And we can go back to what Marx and others, in fact, Rosa Luxemburg in 1905, 1905 already, she challenged Marx on the emphasis on wage labor, yeah, on the, the struggle in factories. She was questioning then already, what about the labor of care in communities where workers live out the daily life? Yeah, so my, my basic, my, one of my questions then is, what has been your little bit you've picked up about how the UDF came about, my own experience about it came from the ground, civics, etc. And then, of course, just maybe uh, what are your observations about how that experience can inform the prison? Thank you very much, Chris. I'm sorry, maybe I've taken a bit more extra time now. Thanks. No, no problem. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll end it now over to Ash and then uh, we'll. We'll take Salim's question in the next round. Um, thanks everyone for those uh, questions. I will um, I will take on um, <laughs> the, the the aspiration for uneven success in in responding to <laughs> some of these questions because they're I mean a lot of really great questions and really big. Um, I'll go in order of them asking. Uh, no, you're speaking about comparing uh, this moment to other examples of, of fronts um, and from there trying to assess uh, the uneven success of certain fronts and others. Um, so my, I, I guess with regards to the, uh, I mean, maybe actually to, to answer this question, I'm not going to speak directly to any of those that you raised, which were the South African United Front National Forum and the, and, and the UDF. Um, but I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, an attempt in the National Liberation Movement in Namibia, which I think um, highlights some of the contradictions that were present in um, the South African Liberation Movement in, in another way, and they, they were kind of related in, in some sense. So in, in, in 64, there's an attempt um, to build SWANLIFT, which is the Southwest African National Liberation Front. Um, and that was basically from the desire of people predominantly involved in SWAPO and SWANU, uh, who were organized inside Namibia, but also with other um, organizations of, of, um, of the oppressed. 
it was a desire amongst those groups to work together on certain campaigns and issues. Um, and crucially, um, to achieve, to, to, to organize some form of um, democratic funding structure um, and kind of a distribution of resources amongst all of those movements um, because a situation was developing where there was a competition for resources, particularly um, external in, in exile. Um, and basically that uh, this organized group of people inside the country sent a memorandum to those who were organizing exile to the Swapo and the Swana leaderships. The Swana leadership uh, approved it. Um, and initially the Swapo leadership approved it. Uh, but three months later, it was retracted um, because um, one of the people um, who was part of the Swapo leadership, his name is Louis um, Lelengani, I believe, um, wasn't present at the meeting and he was um, basically the most kind of crude reading of it would be that uh, he didn't think that um, Swanu should get to share Swapo's resources. Um, and so basically Swanlef never comes into existence, uh, partly because it's, it's, it's rejected at that level. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying things a great deal here. Um, but I think it does point to one of the major contradictions, which, I, um, which is uh, how the, the emerging exile structures relate to um, the funding structures of the AU and sympathetic foreign governments and the whole diplomatic kind of um, bureaucracy. Um, and I think, I mean, I saw Ariana's on the, on, the, on the meeting and obviously she knows a lot more about the South African United Front than I, than I do. And I think she's, she's, she's written on it in, in part of the PhD. So she could probably say more. But my sense was that that was primarily an exile oriented organization that was attempting to, um, through a collaboration with the ANC, the PAC and SWANU, um, was attempting to kind of somehow cohere efforts towards raising funds um, and organization externally, um, external to the country. Um, I think one of the, uh, I guess the important, one of the important things about ALF is that it was organized by people who were organized inside the country um, and was based on trying to resolve some of the conflicts that were, were, were emerging. Um, and um, I guess the, the, the National Forum, and this starts to maybe answer some of uh, Tepizo's question. Um, no, actually, maybe I'll leave that separate. Um, I'm just thinking about the, the, the National Forum and the UDF and why your profit's a big question. I think <laughs> maybe we can chop, chop it up a bit further. But um, I mean, I think part of the reasons of its failure um, relate to uh, the kind of crushing of the BCN movement at, after Biko's uh, arrest as well. Um, and the failure of the National Forum, I'll, I, have to, I have to think about that and read about it a bit more. I feel like I'm ill-equipped to answer that question now. And then I guess the question of what is a united front, um, and which is also kind of in the territory of the previous question, I guess, and how I answered it. Um, but obviously there's, there's a whole series of different debates that happen uh, at different times around what, what a united front is. And some of those draw on some of the so-called classical debates in, in, in Marxism around the popular front versus a, a, a united front. Um, and my sense is that the debate around what is a united front um, was, very important in the 80s in the in the lead up to the formation of 
the national forum. Um, and I'm not so sure that that, that, uh, that debate, I'm not sure how, um, how, how that debate took place in the process of formation of the ALF. Um, but I guess the, the, from the position of uh, Neville and other people who had a unity movement background, theirs was to strive for what they understood to be a united front. And um, for them, what that would mean is no involvement of uh, people from the ruling class. Um, so for them, a popular front would be something that could include all, almost all elements of society who are resist who um, are resistant to a single kind of issue, or um, but don't necessarily share a, a critique of certain other issues that they would consider fundamental. Um, and so, question of what is a united front? I mean, I think that they takes place in different ways at different times. Um, and I'm not sure if a li I mean, I think a national front is something that I'm trying to bring into the, the, the conversation um, as um, to situate it not as, yeah. So I'm interested in thinking about it, I guess the national front, um, which has a relationship to the idea of a united front and how that comes through a certain tradition of struggle. Um, but if we look at uh, anti-colonial struggles across the world in the mid 20th century and even later, uh, the national front seems to be, um, or a liberation front seems to be a more prevalent form than, than, than a united front, even as debates around what a united front is shaped a lot of those um, things. Um, Tepiso, you asked a question about Toivo's work. Yes, Toivo is an old comrade of mine um, and his work has, um, yeah, been very influential to my thinking and he's been very encouraging and helpful. Um, we had a conversation last week about this work. Um, and then you asked a question, would I consider the ALF a black nationalist um, formation? Uh, and no, I wouldn't. Um, I think there were, there might have been elements within the front who considered themselves black nationalist, but I think part of the, uh, a front is also um, a desire to move to to move beyond like a single ideological position um, and see what is common among certain political uh, um, positions and cohere them around that. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was constituted by members of what Neville speaks about as independent socialist groups, there's members of the Black Consciousness Movement, the PAC, and uh, I think importantly also the, you know, all, like the Black Consciousness Movement particularly also is, is a movement and there was people from a whole variety of positions within that, right? And part of the background to this, the, 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 the front is this non-sectarian moment of learning as well where I think people um, not necessarily for the first time, um, but we're exploring and, and, and reading and learning and kind of taking on um, positions that they hadn't necessarily been exposed to in the, in, in the BCN prior to that. Um, I definitely think it's, yeah. Um, and then to Marcus, your question, um, big, big questions. Um, I mean, what is my sense of how the UDF came about? Um, I, I, would, I would be lying if I said that that was my, uh, that I've done uh, really focused research on that. My sense from people that I've interviewed of which uh, you would be one, is that there's a variety of narratives around it. Um, I guess what I'm trying to show in this paper is that um, without being, without at this stage of the research being able to kind of make a very clear uh, connection or conclusion, 
as to um, the exact impact of the failure or uneven success of the ALF to at least be able to say that this, this attempt existed before the UDF. So the, the conditions of its failure are, are, are in some way part of uh, the condition of the UDF's formation. Um, and what exactly that means and what, um, how that plays out, um, I would have to, I would have to do, do, do more work to, to really be able to respond to that question uh, in, in a more kind of concerted way. My, my sense from, from, from you as well as conversations with others is that a lot of formations uh, start off as people's, people's organizations autonomously and independently constituted um, and become, and through a certain process, uh, the ANC starts to take control of the UDF and or orients it in a certain kind of way. Um, so not necessarily that the ANC started, not that the ANC started it, um, but that there was attempts in some ways from fairly early on, some from a little bit later to control the direction and content of these structures, uh, many of which were independently organized initially. Um, and I mean, yes, I think that for me, the, the real importance of, of this work or conversations around this work at least is to figure out what, you know, how we fail better um, <laughs> or how we it, it, it enhance our, uh, the, the possibilities for more, more, more uneven success um, within contemporary and future struggles. Um, I don't think there's any kind of, you know, formula or anything that we derive from these, these histories, but I think the, the importance of revisiting these non-sectarian moments to me is important for how we think about the future, um, undoubtedly. Thanks. Thanks, Ish. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, very rich themes coming out of this discussion. Um, so I think we, we have time for another round of questions. Um, so I think Salim had a question from the previous round. Perhaps if we can have him first and then Duevo afterwards. Thanks. Thanks very much, Chris. And fascinating, absolutely. And uh, great that you're doing this work, Asher, and that history workshop is encouraging uh, debate and discussion and research around these vital um, hidden histories. I was waiting for Marcus, comrade Marcus, lovely to see you and Karen and others to talk about uh, the other Toivo um, and in the National Liberation Front. In fact, the first cell, please correct me, Marcus, uh, that led up to SWAPO, the Ovumberland People's Liberation Organization. The leading members were actually in the National Liberation Front and they used to meet um, behind a barbershop in Greenpoint. Anyway, these are fascinating facts. Uh, and I think the question about the continuities and discontinuities between that National Liberation Front, because Neville Asher, in the piece you quote in the illuminating moment, the background to the Azanian Manifesto, talks about how that experience of the National Liberation Front um, allowed BCM activists to gravi gravitate to, uh, towards um, you know, those who belonged to the National Liberation Front. So that's, that's a really interesting Point. There is a talk Neville gave, Asher. I'm not sure if you have the document. I don't think it's been published. I might be mistaken, but it's called Steve Biko's Last Attempt at Uniting the Liberation Forces. It was a talk he gave in 2007 at Rhodes. It's very useful. There's some duplication with the piece you're aware of, but I can pass it over there's some very interesting points that are made 
in this talk, uh, which um, I think will assist piecing together the kind of debates and the kind of thinking. I mean, you've really, th this is the peril of coming in the second round, Chris, because <laughs> Asher has answered my questions. I think that the question of sectarianism is absolutely vital, which doesn't take away or diminish what Marcus says about work, grassroots work with communities. But I think that there is another reality and you see this in Kosato and I was there and you know, some of the actors are still alive and you can't dispute the fact that Kosato at the time of its formation was a really grassroots organization of workers, but there is a certain amount of manipulation and sectarianism um, that uh, resulted in the kind of leadership we had with Kosatu. There are other points about the National Forum and the UDF, which are important. And I know Asher very bravely attempted very quickly to talk about the Popular Front and United Front, but these aren't abstract theoretical issues. I mean, the society we're living in today, in a sense, it could be said that those people who had a particular critique of a Popular Front have been vindicated. I mean, when we drew up the Azanian Manifesto, by the way, these weren't just intellectuals or black nationalists. That's a very crude way of capturing what happened there. There were 200 organizations at the National Forum, 600 delegates. There was a very rich debate and discussion, what we call today ancient debates about race and class, where we talked about racial capitalism. So I think what you're doing, Asha and others, through the history workshop is vitally important because many of these things, you know, we shouldn't be we shouldn't succumb to the kind of propaganda and those who had the resources and who can write the history. So this kind of truth telling, this kind of thorough research is absolutely important. Um, I just, um, I think I should stop there, Chris. I, my, my questions really were <laughs> answered by Asher, but I really hope to, uh, encourage this work, support it, and look forward to engaging with the paper uh, and the thesis once it's done. Thanks. Thanks, Salim, uh, for your comments with the uh, sectarianism coming up again. Uh, but yeah, okay, so Toivo, next. Um, all right, cool. So let me see if I can make this brief. So Asher, again, great presentation. And we've been discussing this work for a minute. Um, so I'm just really happy to see you finally, you know, present it to actually see you present this work finally has been really great. Um, so here's my question slash comment. One, I'm thinking of one of the members of the APLF, the Azanian People's Liberation Front. And I think, uh, um, I know you've read about it in some of my work, um, particularly Charles Ntumbeni. And Charles, in my interviews with him, you know, I asked him why was it so tough for the Black consciousness movements in exile to come together and to unify, right? And um, part of what he argued was that we talked a lot about unity, but the daily praxis of unity was lacking. So we actually were uneven, even unable to do simple things together, but everybody's talking about unity when some of that deep, uh, just quote unquote mundane, and I say quotes, right? But that day to day work is not happening, right? And so it got me thinking as you were presenting, I began thinking of if you go back to the 1920s in South Africa, right? Oftentimes you would have activists, right? Who were members of the ANC, the ICU and the UNIA. That wouldn't have been unusual because the work, the day to day praxis work is already pushing you in that direction. Whether you declare unity or not is actually irrelevant, right? And so my question in some ways is what is it that I think sometimes when we and, I, and I've fallen victim to this too. Oftentimes when we're looking for these unified fronts and unified movements, we, 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 like we want some huge declaration where some big conference happens, people come together and everybody's in tears, throwing up the black power fist and then boom, they, we have unity, right? This actually is not how much unity works, right? Um, so my question is, is it possible in this research that you're doing or maybe some future work that you do for us to be looking at some, the day-to-day -day praxis around some of these things? And in some ways I'm thinking about 
the BCPs, right, that Leslie Hadfield has done work on. When you're looking at the BCPs, particularly like the health programs in the rural areas, the leather working uh, factories, right, um, uh, uh, they're all working together, ANC, PAC, BCM, uh, whether you're in the three or not, it's irrelevant, right? Um, um, they're working together in the day-to-day -day practices. It actually doesn't even need to be said that this is a unified front. They're doing the work, right? And so what, how is it, is it possible for us to capture that? And even now, there's a lot more unity that does exist, actually, than I think we give credit to. We just want to have a nice manifesto and a huge you know, ceremony, which now says, boom, we're united, right? Um, but actually, in the praxis, in the day-to-day -day work, and I think um, Marco Solomon has already talked already about the women's movements, right? Women have always been central to these formations, and they're always actually working across political lines. One of the things I was unable to research in Botswana is you have a Black consciousness women's formation. Uh, Nosipo Machova was talking to me about this, but I wasn't able to go deep on it. But when I get back to Azania next year, I'll go deeper on it. Um, they actually formed um, um, a Black, kind of a Black women's house in Botswana right, where actually they were, uh, it was kind of like a safety house for all the women of the various tendencies of, of, the, of the Azanian formations, ANC, PAC, Black consciousness, or whether you weren't even with all three, right, and in their own practice, they're already having a united front, right, so it actually doesn't need to be some huge uh, declaration or statement or whatever, right, so my question is that maybe in the research, what, uh, just what do you think about us looking at just not necessarily having these definitive things right, these big conferences, right, um, which is mostly about leadership trying to come together, right, because usually the grassroots are usually working together, it's the leadership that have the beef, right, um, or the foreign interests, so just, what, is it possible for us to look at unity in that kind of a sense? All right, thanks to you for the question. Um, yeah, is there maybe a last question or comment before ending back over? Okay, um, yeah, then Asha, if you could. Uh... Cool. Um, thanks to comrades Toivo and Salim for their comments and questions. Um, uh, Salim, Salim, please, I would love to see that, um, that speech that, that, that Neville gave uh, at UCAR. Uh, that you mentioned it. Um, I there's a book that he he references uh, in that uh, piece on the Azanian Manifesto where he says that he's he's written elsewhere about this kind of attempt at unity, and I've, I just haven't been able to get hold of that book. So I'm wondering if that speech is has that 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 text in it anyway. Um, and I guess maybe just quickly on the, the, the some of the the Namibian connections within. Uh, or the Namibian comrades within the National Liberation Front. My sense is that Toivo wasn't part of the National Liberation Front. I think he had already been banned to, to uh, so-called, to Ovamboland by that time. But the, one of the central people who was later in touch with and worked closely with Toivo was Andreas Chipanga, um, um, who was one of the, the, the NLF comrades and one of the major links between uh, the NLF and 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 and, and Swapo, um, and yes, I mean this the story of uh, the story of the beginnings of of, of initially the um, the OPO uh, and later becoming Swapo in in the barber shop has been quite quite systematically kind of uh, chopped out of the official Swapo narrative, um, and that relates to kind of the 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 suspension of, 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 of Kenny and, and, and Tilly Abrams um, and a whole range of other kind of politics that happened in the early 60s. Um, to, to maybe maybe to respond, I guess, one other, one other point, Sally, which is not necessarily something that you raised, but um, I guess the figure of Neville um, is uh, one of the, one of the kind of most endlessly giving gifts in this research, as well as presents a particular kind of problem um, to writing history that is not about, you know, a big man. Um, and unquestionably Neville was central to so many different formations, 
Um, and I mean, the brilliance of his intellect, I, I don't have to, to speak about to anyone here, I don't think. Um, but what happens, I think sometimes when people have recollected the story of, for example, the ALF, to me, people who were kind of close to Neville or came out of some of his formation that he was part of, often Neville is kind of presented as the central character in the, the ALF story. Um, but if you go to Neville's text, you know, he's, he's saying that this attempt came from the BCM, which was a policy within the BCM, where the central person was Biko. Um, so it's, um, it's interesting, even how I came to this, uh, this work was initially thinking that this was another attempt that a group around Neville had kind of uh, initially thought of and um, kind of tried to organize. And it became you know, clear very quickly that um, even though Neville and the people around him were central to the, the process, it wasn't initiated by him, even by his own um, remarks. And Salim, I'm not, I'm not responding to that saying that you were saying that or anything, um, but just a, 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 a something that I've been thinking about in the process of doing this um, is how the actual history decenters some of these figures uh, in useful ways. Um, and then Toivo, I think you, you raise a really great question uh, at a point. Um, and I think that, and I'll, I'll respond to it in two ways. Um, one is something I tried to respond to uh, about the, the difference between internal and external exile organizations is the kind of one of the differences being the need to be working across partisan affiliation because certain issues require that and that form of organizing already exists. And externally, because of the because of the terms of order, because the terms of order recognize uh, people organized in particular kinds of ways, perhaps the partisan um, and sectarian politics are enhanced um, externally because of, as you mentioned, the distance from day-to-day -day organizing um, and the, the kind of material need to be working together. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think I, for me, I try to capture that in the paper by, sh by showing that the attempt to build the ALF uh, exists and comes out of at least two sets of dynamics. One being the fact that the, 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 the relationships developing between the exile and internal movements was needed resol resolution in some way. And two, that some form of non-sectarianism had already been developing and was emerging. So in, the, in forms of organizing and in um, um, forms of thinking together, discussion, critique, et cetera. So I think, of course, these moments are deeply important. Um, I also do think that at different historical moments, um, the form, the organized expression of unity, which is really just a question about the organizational form of liberation forces, may need to formalize itself in some way, right? Um, and I think that's really what the, 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 the attempt to form a front is. So my, my intention is not to focus on these big moments with the manifesto and whatever, but rather to show, A, how that emerges from a certain practice of already organizing together and kind of, you know, to try and figure out what the, um, what the conditions were such that that was necessary in that form. Um, thanks. All right, thanks, Asha. Um, yeah, I think if there's no other comments, then uh, uh, I think we can end it off there. But I think we already have so many, uh, you know, interesting themes and, and narratives, uh, you know, especially about, uh, thinking about the ways that we organize today, you know, I think that was one of the, the most interesting uh, things that we took away from the comments and the discussion. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. Thanks to everyone for joining us. And I wish you all the best with the rest of your research and your PhD. Thanks, Chris and Njogu and internet for
organizing everything. Thanks very much, Ash and others. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks to you, Marcus. Uh, okay. Cheers. All the best, Asha. Cool. <laughs> Great work. Bye. Bye. Bye.